We are live. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. This is Aaron Roy with Teachable. I'm live today with the incredible, always enjoyable to hang out with Jay Klaus. Uh, we're going to get started in just a few moments. Uh, if you haven't joined us for a workshop before, the first two to three minutes, we just want to make sure everything works technically before I hand it to Jay and, and he kind of walks through his material. So if you're joining us, you know, first off, we appreciate that. But number two, let us know in the chat uh, if you could see us, if you could hear us. Uh, if you've seen Jay before, if this is your first time, it's always great to, to hear in the comments. Also, what you're excited to learn today. That's something that you know we value. Jay could see these comments after. So let us know you could see us. Let us know you could hear us before we, we get into the, the real meat and potatoes of this conversation. Uh, and Jay, why, why don't we test some of your tech as well? Let's make sure everything sounds great before we get started. Hello, everybody. How embarrassing would it be if things didn't sound great for a workshop about podcasting? That would be just so unfortunate. Uh, so hopefully that is not the case, and hopefully everything looks good, sounds good, and we have uh, one heck of a way to end our Friday. Cool. I'm still waiting for some of these comments to come through. I want to make sure folks can see us and hear us. So well, I am actually going to wait until I see this in the chat. So please, please, please. Use this chat to let us know things sound good and hear good. And I'll wait for Please. those comments. We need you guys. You guys are an equal part of this process. And <laughs> we need you now more than ever. Got it. So still going to wait a few seconds here. Uh, and if you haven't joined us before, and we'll take care of some housekeeping while we wait, The how this is going to go is once we... Great. You could, they could hear us. They could see us. I'm going to kick it to Jay in just a few moments. And you know, for the next... We're going to go through Jay's presentation, but we will leave time for some Q&A uh, at the end of this conversation. So if you have any questions for Jay, if there's any uh, you know questions about this content, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, and if it's something that's super urgent, perhaps we'll bring it up to Jay as he goes through the presentation, but we will try to leave time at the end. Um, Jay, uh, actually, someone said you're a little quiet. I know you said you were coming oh, in hot. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. I guess I'll get, I'll get right back up here on the microphone then just to make sure that's not the case. I didn't want to blow your guys' eardrums out, so I'm glad you guys told me because I would have been a little bit further away, and hopefully this sounds a little bit better. Great. And, and as this goes on today, feel free to let us know in the chat um, if, if you think Jay is too quiet. Because again, uh, this is a chat about a podcast like The Pros, and uh, having heard Jay many times before, we want to make sure this is perfect. Uh, well, Jay, I think we have this going here. It sounds great. I'm seeing much better in the chat, which is what I wanted to see. Why don't you give us a little bit about your background and let's get into this and I'll, I'll pop backstage if you need anything at all let me know and i'll pop right back out all right well thanks aaron thanks teachable for having me here today podcasting is one of my favorite things that i'll as i'll uh talk about uh aaron could you share my screen for me and i'll, I'll dive right in here absolutely today we are going to talk about attracting podcast listeners with narrative storytelling so i imagine some of you watching this already have a podcast some of you might just be considering a podcast and this is kind of you feeling out the waters, learning a little bit more about it. And I hope this uh, this presentation actually speaks to both of you uh, types of people, depending on where you are in your journey. For the most part, uh, over the last year, I've been hosting a couple of podcasts, one being called Creative Elements, where I talk to high profile creators about how they made a living from their art and creativity. Think of it like how I built this, but for online digital creators. In another podcast called Upside, where I talk to uh, early stage startups that are not based in San Francisco. That's a super niche show. Uh, we've been doing it for about three years, but it taught me a lot about podcasting. I also have an education platform called Freelancing School where I help people make a living freelancing, I have a course here on Teachable about freelancing actually. And I've been creating courses for LinkedIn Learning and lynda.com. So course creation in my blood, podcasting also in my blood now as well. Podcasting is awesome. Podcasting is like my favorite thing. And over the last year, Creative Elements literally just had its first birthday, and it's had a really, really big successful year. It's been featured in Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Castro, even Apple Podcasts, and I believe CastBox as well. And I've had the opportunity through that show to talk to Seth Godin, James Clear, Vanessa Van Edwards, Matt Diavella, the guy who directed Minimalism, uh, Ali Abdal, a huge YouTuber, Pat Flynn and his business partner, Matt Gartland. It's opened up all these incredible doors for me uh, because I have this podcast. And it's had a lot of even commercial success too. In just one year, the show has uh, gotten over 500,000 downloads, which is way more than I would have expected. Um, and it's because 
I put a lot of effort into the production of this show. This is David Perel. He's gotten pretty well known uh, on Twitter and elsewhere as a guy who can teach you writing. Actually, I think his course on crushing Twitter is one of the most popular courses here on Teachable. I interviewed him and he shared it in his newsletter and said a very nice thing. He said, this interview is unlike most of the ones I've done because it's so well edited. It's less like a traditional interview and more like an NPR show. We spoke about growing a Twitter audience, my time working as a television anchor, and how I failed at every institutional game I've ever played. I love seeing feedback like this because that tells me the thing I'm trying to do is actually working. The amount of energy that I'm putting into the edit, into production is being noticed, but I am not NPR. I am one guy. I have one audio engineer that I work with. But I'm here to talk to you about how this is possible as an indie podcaster to have a really high production show, even though I'm not trained in audio. It really comes down to storytelling and narrative. Uh, the show has more than 155 star reviews. Just to continue to back up, I put a lot of effort into it and people seem to like it. I take production quality super, super seriously. And I take storytelling really, really seriously. This is what a typical project file at the end of an episode looks like. I have three different tracks, all of them with a lot of cuts. Uh, I have the interview track where I have my, my guests and I actually talking from the interview part of the show. I have voiceovers that are record in the beginning and throughout that's actually scripted. And I also bring in third party B roll type audio throughout the process as well to spice up the episodes and really make it more of an experience. As I said in my own intro, this isn't my first podcast. Upside, the podcast interviewing startups, has more than 170 episodes. It itself has 150,000 downloads, a little more than that. And we've been, pub we've been publishing it for three years. So that experience, plus also working with the Podglomerate, a podcast network that I'm a part of, has taught me a lot about podcasting. And my goal here today is to take the lessons I've learned from three plus years of podcasting and working with this really incredible podcast network to help you really uh, fast forward your own learning and understanding as it comes to podcasting. Something else that may be becoming a little bit more obvious is that podcasting is a lot of work. So before we get into the nitty gritty of production and storytelling and narrative, I want to focus on why should you start a podcast in the first place? Why should you even care? If you haven't started or if you haven't started or haven't like pushed into publishing yet, why would you start a podcast? First and foremost, it is the best networking hack that I have ever found. It is an incredible way to meet people, people that you've been looking up to for years who you want to meet. Just yesterday, I interviewed my own favorite podcaster, uh, Cole Kushner, the guy who has Dissect, like one of the best podcasts on the planet. I got to talk to him yesterday for an hour because I have a podcast. Pretty cool. This is Seth Godin, the, the conversation I had with him. He showed up in a literal sound booth. How cool is that? Uh, and I wouldn't have been able to just have an hour-long conversation with Seth Godin if I didn't have a platform to do that. Podcasting also forces you to be a better speaker. I, I tweeted this out, and I'm kind of proud of it because I think it makes a lot of sense. I think podcasting is kind of like a modern day Toastmasters because you get a ton of practice. You can get a ton of different reps, but you can also edit the final thing before you share it. Like before people give you feedback on it, you can make it sound better in the edit and you can get uh, a very tight feedback loop because not only do other people hear this and give you feedback on what you're saying and what you're making, but you can hear yourself. It's like an athlete watching tape, you know? You can see what you did well, what you didn't do well, and then you can course correct and change your actions. Podcasting also helps you create a habit of publishing. Creating anything is pretty much like making your own lottery ticket. There's a world where that lottery ticket actually hits and you hit the jackpot. Like if you do really, really well on this thing, it could actually do some incredible things for your life that you may not even be able to imagine. Like, let's play this out. Let's play out. What if this goes really, really well? Well, we can think about Joe Rogan, who's kind of like at the top of the podcasting heap. Literally, the guy from Fear Factor is like the highest earning podcaster on the planet. And he has 
11 times the audience of Howard Stern. And this was years ago. I'm sure it's even bigger now. Howard Stern is like the biggest guy in radio. And Joe Rogan, a podcaster, is dwarfing his audience. And in doing some back-of-the-napkin math, based on Joe's 200 million downloads per month that he reported in, like, I think 2016 or 2018, if he has a low CPM for ads of $18, which is low, that means he would earn up to $240 million per year in ads alone on his show. So this is something that can go incredibly, incredibly well for you and earn you a lot of money. More people are listening to podcasts now than ever before. This is even a little bit dated. I think actually the Infinite Dial came out with their 2020 research here recently, and it continues to rise. And people are listening to an average of seven podcasts per week. So there is a ton of potential for you to get in here as an indie podcaster and not only create something really, really awesome, but also carve out a little bit of an income for yourself. Now in the chat, I'm going to take a drink of water here. In the chat, I would love to hear who here uh, has a podcast already uh, and who here um, is thinking about launching a podcast. Just let me know where you are in your podcasting journey. Say, I'm thinking about it or I published 20 episodes. Let me know where you are in your journey right now. I can tell you, Jay, we're always thinking about it. <laughs> teachable, teachable at the podcast? No, no, discover, 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 right? Okay, like, we, okay. we, we always think about it too. Teachable has a podcast. It's uh, in between seasons, but it's something we're constantly working on. We, we work with so many wonderful creators, so many stories to tell. All right. Well, I have a lot of ideas for you on how you can make this really great. I'm seeing some people. I'm thinking about it, thinking about it, looking into potential opportunity. Awesome. Well, as you may have guessed, a um, lot of opportunity, but this is not a get rich quick scheme. You're not going to get rich tomorrow by just uh, pushing play or pushing publish. There's a lot of work and thought to go into this because there are over a million active podcasts. That's a lot. There are also like 31 million YouTube channels. So to me, that means there's still a ton of opportunity in podcasting. But if you're going to do it, you need to stand out. And I would tell you that I think your goal should be, how do I make a podcast that is so good that it can literally be somebody's favorite podcast? Like you need to be the favorite. Yes, people are listening to an average of seven podcasts per week. But to be in that seven and to stay in that seven, it's a pretty high bar. You need to be really, really good. So always be thinking, how do I make a show that can be so good that it's somebody's actual favorite? Because that's a pretty high bar. So some questions to ask yourself before you get started, or even if you have started, it might be worth re-examining some of the decisions you've made or some of the questions that you didn't ask. First and foremost, what is the point? What is your goal in doing the podcast? If this goes really well, or if this goes moderately well, how will you know that your goals have succeeded? You need to have an answer for why am I doing this podcast? And it may be that you want to get practice public speaking. It may be that you want to meet people. Like if you're like me, it may be that you actually want to earn an income. So you should just be really ruthlessly honest with yourself. What is my goal for doing a podcast? Who are you making the podcast for? Very specifically, what type of person is listening to your show? Why do they listen to the show? What does it do for them? Why would they listen to your show? Have a very specific reason. Uh, for me with Creative Elements, that show is for aspiring online creators, people who want to make a living with their art and creativity. And for them, it encourages them that they are not too late even to this day to make that happen. It gives them the behind the scenes look at how some of their heroes got started and you find that it's pretty messy for a lot of people. And it's, it's something, it's an act of discovery and it's something that anybody can accomplish. Then you have to ask yourself, is that being done for them elsewhere? When I started the show, I looked around and the people I wanted to interview, people like Seth Godin, people like James Clear, they do a lot of podcast interviews, but they talk about their domain expertise. Seth Godin goes on podcasts to talk about marketing. James talks about habits. I want to talk to them about how did you make a living from your art and creativity? What is the business model behind this? I want the behind the scenes, how I built this type of look for online digital creators. And then ask yourself, is the show educational 
or entertaining because these are the two categories that people mostly lean into when they're listening to podcasts. I listen to something because it's entertaining or I listen to something because it's teaching me something. My opinion is it's a lot harder to compete on the entertaining side of the spectrum because you have people like Conan O'Brien, Mark Marin, people who have decades in show business who are professional entertainers who have an audience who have like a really good handle on their thing and they can just start a podcast tomorrow because they have the resources they're good on the microphone it's hard to compete in that world then you need to ask yourself what is the format of my show will you have a co-host will you interview guests do you have any specific recurring segments that are interesting? You know, like a mailbag where you read something about uh, read something from one of your listeners. Or, hey, we have a podcast about The Bachelorette. In this specific segment, we talk about, like, the one line from the season or the episode that we just can't believe this person said. You know, something that's a little bit special, a little bit novel. What is your target episode length? I'll tell you that pre-COVID, and we're getting back into a world where people are probably going to be traveling. So we're going back into a post-COVID world. Pre-COVID, the average commute time was 26.6 minutes. So if you're thinking about the length of your show, you want to be around this so that people can actually fit it into a commute. And even if you have a longer show, you might want to think about twice this. So if I'm going to and from, can I finish this episode on my commute? A lot of people will listen at like one and a half speed. So if you have a show that's 30 to 35 minutes, you can still fit within that. How often will you publish? A lot of people, you know, the reason I'm laying out these questions is a lot of people have assumptions on what these things should be. They'll assume that they should do interviews because most podcasts do interviews. They'll assume that they'll publish weekly, but I'm here to say you can go outside of these constraints. You can not interview guests. You can do a solo show. Uh, Cole Kushner, the host of Dissect I was just talking about. That's a completely solo show that he produces himself, had produced himself until it got bought by Spotify, but there's never any guests. It's just him telling the story. I also think doing something every week is exhausting for a lot of people. Maybe it is instead seasonal. Maybe you do one season of 12 episodes. You can break out of these assumptions or you can do once every two weeks you publish an episode. So that way you're not always just publishing producing and promoting all in one week, you have an extra week to actually market the show that you probably just put a ton of effort into. And then finally, what makes your show remarkable? I think for you to have a show that is somebody's absolute favorite show, there needs to be something really, really distinct about it. And so for me, I've leaned into a couple things. One being, I didn't find any other shows that are doing this behind the scenes look. How did this creator make this into a full-time thing? And second, I wanted to stand out with my production value and with the experience of listening to the show. I didn't want it just to feel like another interview show. I wanted it to feel very narrative. And I will also say, in my opinion, shorter podcasts are easier to start and grow in the early days because the biggest hurdle you have is somebody hitting play the first time to see if they actually like your show. And I'm much more likely to take that risk if the show is... 20 minutes than if it's an hour and a half. So I just talked a little bit about remarkability. Remarkability applies to not only the concept of your show, but every single episode of that show. And so I want to dig into some of the things episode by episode that you should be thinking about if you're producing this show and you want to do it in a engaging, uh, captivating way. I had slides for this. <laughs> this all starts with the concept of each episode. You should pick an angle for each episode ahead of time. You should know what is the story in this episode that fits within the format of my show, but what is the story that I want to tell in this specific episode? And the best way to think about that is what does my listener care to hear from this person. You need to constantly be the advocate for your listener. You should know who these people are so well that as you're doing an interview, you can almost hear them in the back of your head saying like, oh, ask him about this, dig in deeper to this, ask how, ask why. You need to be that attuned to your listener. So for me, I do my, my pre-interview 
research in a Notion document. And I have a few of these properties that are consistent uh, episode to episode. Where at the top, I'll put the name of the guest. I'll have like a really quick verb or blurb. Here's what the guest is known for. Here's the interview date. Uh, it's an interview style. Here's their website, their Twitter, their Instagram, their YouTube, uh, the element that comes out of it. But where the magic really happens is in the research. I'll research this person's bio. I'll pull out like interesting quotes I hear from other podcasts or from articles or from things that are written about this person. That will uh, start to tell me what is the unique story I can tell here. Not only am I going to dig into how this person made a living from their art and creativity, but what is specifically even more interesting about this person? Because you usually only have maybe an hour. And again, this is an interview show. We can talk about uh, solo shows too, but you only probably have an hour of the listener's time too, maybe less. You need to think about this. This is a constrained amount of time. When somebody walks away from this episode, what is the takeaway I want them to have? So after I do some research, I define at the top here, a goal for every specific episode, because once I know here's the story I want to tell in this one, here's what I want to pull out from this guest. That goal then informs the questions that I ask, because I know if I have an hour to talk to this guest and my goal is to really get into the specifics of how to unlock your creativity, both as a self-identified creative person and as someone who thinks they are not create creative, that could be a pretty meaty topic. We're going to have to spend a lot of time doing that, which means I may have to cut out some of the basic questions that I wanted to ask. Um, a good example here, the first question I have on this document is, let's talk about Wheel of Fortune. Because when I was talking with Alan Gannett, I saw in his bio that he was a runner-up on Wheel of Fortune. And I thought that was interesting. But ultimately, as I was getting into the questions, I realized that wasn't super aligned with the goal. That's not necessarily going to teach people how to unlock their creativity. Um, it's going to take away time from a question that will. So you should have an angle ahead of time, ahead of talking to these people, that informs your questions and uh, aligns with the takeaway you want your audience to have. Not only does it inform the questions that you end up asking, it also informs the order that you ask them. Because if you have this takeaway, this, this idea of here's how to unlock your creativity, you kind of want to build up to that, right? You kind of want to follow a narrative arc. And I think about it as a literal arc, as in, Early on, we kind of get comfortable, get comfortable with the guests, get comfortable with this episode. And to get comfortable with the listener, even you need to start a little bit easy. And then you can kind of build up to more intense questions, especially if they're building on the answers that you had previously heard from the guest. So you start to say, okay, I know I want to get into unlocking your creativity, but actually I know that Alan had this experience in his past that led him to uh, unlock his own creativity. So before I can get into, in the interview, asking him how others can do that, I want to make sure that first we touch on the story of his own relationship to creativity. So I can start to build up and follow a narrative arc here. It informs the follow-ups you ask, because sometimes a guest will kind of go on a tangent and they'll say something that's really, really interesting. And it might challenge you to think, oh, I want to follow up on that. I want to go down that path. I want to learn more about this thing you just kind of said offhand. But if that doesn't serve the goal, you might have to say, you know what? That's interesting, maybe for a part two someday, but we don't have time to discover that right now. I want to make sure I have enough time to get to the goal of this episode. This also informs the audience's key takeaway and experience. We've kind of already talked about that. And this affects the final production of the episode because you may, in the final edit, realize I asked questions a little bit out of order. I want to move this question over here because I know that's going to line up better and give the context the audience needs to really understand this insight that came later in the interview. I know that sounds a little, uh, a little ambiguous, so let's get in a little bit more deeper here into certain decisions you can make in production to really tie this narrative together and make your show stand out. Think about your episode as an experience. It's, it's not just, hey, let me let you listen in 
on a conversation or, hey, I'm, let me let you listen in to my unstructured thoughts. This should be like an engaging, captivating, immersive experience for the listener. And let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of a podcast so you can kind of start to see the levers that you have to form this experience for, for that listener. I'm a big fan of opening with like a 10 to 12 second clip from the episode because the first thing I hear, if it's a really interesting sentence or idea, I'm starting to get hooked already. I'm starting to get a taste of what this episode is going to be about. And that's going to be really interesting. Um, I just published episode 50 with an animator who goes by Smearballs. That's his name. And the opening clip was him saying, I get a lot of enjoyment thinking about people in like the KFC or Old Spice marketing department saying the name Smearballs, saying Smearballs is going to do a marketing campaign for them. That's just like a really funny, interesting clip. And it also tells me, oh, wow, this guest has worked with KFC, has worked with Old Spice. I want to hear about that because maybe I aspire to work with clients like that. So it's both engaging and it's illustrative of what's going to be in this episode. Then I have what's called the opening theme. This is like the, the theme music for your show that should sound like nothing else. It's like an audio watermark of your world, your experience, your show. That eases you into typically what I think of as like an episodic intro. This is very specific to each individual episode. It's starting to get you warmed up to what the bulk of this podcast is going to be. You know, in a lot of uh, presentations, they'll, they'll give you the format of like, tell me what you're going to tell me, tell me, and then tell me what you told me. And podcasts kind of follow the same thing. You have the bulk of the show, which you know is really interesting because you constructed it, but you have to get people interested to get into it. And so the intro is really your chance to convince the listener who's already hit play that they've made a good choice and they should continue listening. Then I like to have transition music. I've kind of color coded the music in yellow here. Transition music is like a subtle audio cue to know I'm moving on to the next phase of the story. Same with the opening theme. These are all just like subtle cues to let the listener know, here's what's happening next. I'm transitioning into the next thing. Then you have the episodic middle, which is really where the bulk of the storytelling happens. Then another transition to kind of give the cue, hey, we're moving along. Episodic close. This is the tell me what you told me area. This is like the audience kind of taking a deep breath. Like, whew. it's kind of a place for them to process and think about what they just heard. And it's an also an opportunity for you to both usher them out of this experience and cement some of the key learnings in that episodic middle cement that learning goal you had for the episode. Then you can have your closing theme, which again is probably related to the opening theme. It's a nice bookend. It's a nice experience of start, finish, close the loop. And if we talk about ads, the most successful shows have a few different points within the show to introduce ads so that it doesn't interrupt the experience of the show. Uh, my show in particular, and a lot of shows follow this format. I have pre-roll, which is before anything else, I have the pre-roll ad. Technically, you could put a pre-roll in the first couple of minutes of the show, um, but I like to start right at the beginning. Here's the pre-roll ad. So it's not, it's almost as if before you get into the experience, I don't want to get you into the experience, then immediately break up that experience. I kind of want to get it out of the way first. Then mid-roll, I have two spots of mid-roll in the middle of the episode because my shows are typically 60 minutes long. So at about, at about minute 15 and then minute 30, I'll have uh, a, a quick, um, I'll have kind of a cliffhanger where we open a thought and it's really interesting. And I'll say, we'll get to that right after this. I'll do the mid-roll ads. And then post-roll comes at the very, very end. Jay, if you don't mind me asking, right? I saw a question in the audience I think is applicable right here. Um, you know, I wanted to bring up 
like kind of ideal podcast length because you've you've walked us through each phase of, of this puzzle. But and you, I know yours is sixty minutes. Have you experimented with thirty minutes? Do you have any thoughts on these pieces or, or longer? You know, two hours seems like a marathon, but <laughs> like have you tried that too? Yeah, there there's there are a lot of ways to think about it here. You know, all this is a puzzle. You need to you need to create what makes the most sense for your show to be an engaging, immersive experience that makes sense. Um, if you think about a show like Song Exploder, Song Exploder is a show where um, this guy takes apart a musician's song through their stories and literally pulls apart piece by piece what goes into the song. But songs are about three minutes long. So in Song Exploder, this this show is like 17 to 20 minutes. And that's about as long as it needs to be. Like my short answer for you is the ideal length is no longer and no shorter than you need to tell the most efficient story. Like you need to respect your listener's ear and your listener's time. And you don't want anything in the show that is not a value add to that listener. And depending on your format, your unique format and the message you're trying to deliver, that might be 10 minutes. That might be Joe Rogan doing 90 minutes. You know, you do have to realize that the longer your show, if people are listening to it, the more opportunity you have to introduce ads and have it not be an annoying experience because there's more space between them. So for me, I know that shorter shows may be easier to grow in the immediate term because it's easier to get people to listen for the first time. But I also know I want to tell stories that take me about an hour to get through about 45 minutes of interview anyway. And I also want to monetize the show. So Doing a 60 minute show gives me the opportunity to do that without it being too annoying or too much feeling like, ah, there's ads every five minutes here. You know, I really wanted to space them out. So to answer your question, Paola, it's, it's really dependent on your show and how long you think it's going to take you to tell your story in the most efficient manner possible. Thank you for that, Jack. All the way through this, you know, uh, outline of what a, a typical podcast episode should look like it should be cohesive and engaging and you have some levers to play with i'm going to go with, through them one by one the first is narrative we are all suckers for a story because when we hear a story with a person a protagonist we are able to project ourselves onto that experience or their experience onto ourselves. Like it's easy for us to take the role of that protagonist we're hearing and relate to it. And we like, we like that feeling because it helps us connect where we are today to where we want to be. We can take their story, imagine ourselves as the hero in that story and, and kind of play that forward. Sound design is a really good way to, um, make your show more engaging. The, the, the breaks that I showed you in that episode, the transition between intro and episodic middle and episodic middle to episodic end, that is basically sound design, helping the listener feel a certain way as you're going through. The best shows that I listen to who put a ton of work into production, and once you hear this, you kind of can't unhear it, they will introduce small beds of music that have like a mood to them to tell you how to feel about a thing you're hearing. If you listen to an NPR show or a Gimlet show, when a guest or somebody is speaking and telling a story, they will often back that story up with music that is meant to make you feel a certain way. It's the same way with like movies and film scores. They design music to help you feel the way they want you to feel at that point in the story. And you can do that as a podcaster. Voiceover is something that I use a lot in creative elements that I think is radically underused because voiceover gives you the ability to move the story forward in a way that doesn't require you to do it perfectly in real time in the interview if that makes sense basically voiceover is something you can record afterwards to tell the story like explicitly read out the things that are happening between the lines if you couldn't do that on air it also helps you cover for areas where um, you didn't ask the question that you wanted to ask or ask it as well as you wanted to ask it. I've had a ton of interviews where I'll ask a question and I kind of fumble over my words or say too much. And really I can 
state that question to the listener, the audience, in a much more compact way, and the guest's response still feels like a response. Or if I move things around in the final interview and the question I ask no longer makes sense, I can cover that up with voiceover. I also said, or specific lack thereof here, because one of the one of the things I do in every episode that I think adds a little bit of polish that anybody can do if you're interviewing guests. After I do my intro, I do the transition music, and out of the transition music, I go straight into the guest's response. Because usually, I ask the guests like, hey, take me to this moment in your history. What were you doing the year before you started this business? And the guests will say, well, I was working at my dad's butcher shop. You don't need my question to jump into that point in the answer and feel like you know what's going on. But it feels much more immersive because you come out of the music, the sound design I have, right into that guest answer. It feels like you're just jumping into conversation. It's really, really good. This point, show not tell, I think is really important too, especially as it relates to uh, the intro of your episode. Again, I, I'm deferring a lot to examples with guest interviews here. Uh, if we have questions afterwards and you want to go into how do these things apply to a solo show, we can. But with my interviews of guests, in the intro, I try to make it really, really clear why are we talking to this person. When you line up an interview, you're doing that for a reason. If you're doing a solo show around a certain topic, you're doing that for a reason. But I feel a lot of shows don't take it seriously enough to contextualize why we're talking about this thing or why we're talking to this person. And your intro is the best place to do that. In that intro also, you have the opportunity to start introducing the guest's voice. So if, I, um, if I'm talking to Dan Andrews, another podcaster, and he was one of the earliest podcasters that I've ever known. Um, he was podcasting when you were just on iPods. iPhones didn't exist. The iPod experience was really bad. So in the intro, I was trying to make Dan sound legit by saying he's been podcasting since 2006, before the iPhone, when you're just on the iPod. And technology was a little bit different then. After I say technology was a little bit different then, I could personally describe the process and how painful it was, or I can cut my voiceover and pull in Dan's answer from the interview talking about how the process was different. That's much more engaging. That is a show, not tell moment. Also, through the interview, if this person references their work, let's say I'm talking to a musician, and they say, yeah, I was working on this song uh, called Round Here. I'm talking to the Counting Crows, I guess, in this example. I was working on Round Here, and there was a point in that song when XYZ. That's a moment for you to try to find that audio and pull it into the show. Because now, instead of just telling me how that sounds, I can actually hear it as a listener. And it gives me a much more rich experience. That's third-party audio. That's pretty much what I'm talking about, bringing in B-roll. Um, when I introduce guests, I often like to pull audio from YouTube. Like if somebody has uh, given a presentation that I thought was really good, or if they were uh, announced on some TV show, I'll, I'll try to pull that in sometimes. I like to pull in clips of their own work from their YouTube channel or their own podcast if they have one. But all of these things, all these things are tied together around the idea of narrative. How do I tell an engaging story in a unique way that isn't me just like preaching the whole time? How do I pull in different ways to help me move the story forward in a way that makes time move faster than, than it feels? The total time that I work on an episode is probably nine to 17 hours. And it's gotten towards the bottom line. And this is talking about vetting guests, sending emails to schedule with the guests, preparing for the interview, conducting the interview, and then post-production. I've gotten the post-production time down to about five hours per episode, but all in each episode, I probably put in nine to 17 hours, which may seem like a lot to you if, you, if you're not putting in that kind of time. But I wouldn't do it if I didn't love it. And I wouldn't do it if I didn't think I was making something really remarkable and unique that the world needed and that people really appreciated. And also, I outsource my audio engineering. You know, this editing, these creative edits, I do that as far as 
lining it up, scripting it, moving the files around. But when it comes to actually making the audio sound really, really good and mixing the final file, I outsource that. I've outsourced that since day one. And I would recommend you do that too, because you can go to Upwork and you can find somebody that can do an incredibly good job uh, for $20 an hour. And I don't know about you, but I can, I can do a lot more with my time and I value my time more than, than uh, $20 per hour when it comes to this task, because it would take me three times as long for them to do the same amount of work that they can do in, you know, 20 minutes. It might take me an hour or something I can do in 20 minutes. And so it's just worth outsourcing to somebody who can do it really good because this is an audio product. You want that audio to be really, really good. All right. So I know I covered a lot of ground here. If you want to learn more about this, this is where my course podcast, like the pros comes in. I've taken everything I've learned from three plus years of podcasting, almost 250 episodes, uh, 650,000 downloads. I put it into this course where I cover ideation, even more in depth, how to discover a format of a show that you really, really like audio quality, how to make your show sound as good as possible using your gear and your guest gear, the basics of mis mixing, uh, hiring an engineer, an audio engineer, how to find somebody great booking guests, preparing for interviews, my full production process in depth. I literally go through screen share after screen share of the actual technology I use, the way I set it up. I give you templates of my air table, uh, that I use to track the whole process, a deep dive on Squadcast, Calendly, transcripts, editing and scripting the, the 5.7 lesson editing and scripting. It's almost 30 minutes where I go screen share, walk you through editing an episode for narrative for sound design. So you know exactly how I do that in creative elements. Then I even get into marketing strategies, advertising and sponsorship, working with a podcast network. There are 36 lessons here, five hours of content. It's usually $199, which I think is a steal, but for the next week, it is $159 here through Discover on Teachable, which is even more of a steal. I hate discounting, absolutely hate it, uh, but to do a workshop like this, I know there's an opportunity to make this a no-brainer for you, and so we are doing that to the best of our ability here with this deal uh, for podcasts like The Pros. It's gotten really incredible feedback, and I'm going to get to some, some questions I saw in the chat here in a moment. It's gotten really incredible feedback. Literally people saying it's amazing. It's the best course they've ever taken part in. Um, literally changed my whole vision for 2021. Great stuff. I had no interest in podcasting, but I still couldn't help but binge the entire course. Uh, I wish I would have had this before I started my podcast. Your course is amazing. The videos for your podcast are fire. Top-notch quality. Get on this course and yours will be too. So people are saying really nice things. It's rated really highly. Everyone who's taken it and rated it have given it almost perfect review, nine or 10 stars. So that's the pitch. Uh, Aaron already put the link in the chat, discover.teachable.com. You can save $40 there today. I hope you take me up on it. It's, it's everything I've learned in three years. So make it easy on yourself. Take the time, go through the lessons. You're gonna come out with a much better product. In conclusion, podcasting is a tremendous tool for networking and publishing. If you take it seriously, it can even make you some money. Taking it seriously is a lot of work. And that begins with thinking about the concept of your show and your episodes. So take your production quality seriously from the beginning. Podcasts like the pros will help you do that. I promise you lean into the narrative of each episode and be quick to outsource the actual audio engineering, please. It's going to save you a lot of time. Again, in the course, I tell you how to find an audio engineer uh, that can take that off your plate. So Aaron, we're good to get into questions here. My last thought is if you want these slides, if you want the slides to uh, go back through this and remember some of the notes we've taken, it's at workshops.jclaus.com slash podcasts. And you can connect with me on Twitter or Instagram as well. Hey, thank you so much. I mean, 
that is, you covered a lot of ground and you covered it fairly quickly. So we appreciate you offering this content. I mean, this is a free workshop and I feel like I, every time you speak, I, I learned something I didn't know. Um, I did want to grab a few questions from the audience and I, I have some questions for you today as well. Um, it, Cause we do have a few minutes uh, left at least. One thing I wanted to bring up, and I think I've always wondered this question is like music licensing, right? Like there's obviously a big difference between commercial and non-commercial royalties. Can you speak a bit to this? Yes. Super important, especially if you're using it as part of uh, your shows like theme. So um, for creative elements, I had music custom made for the show. So that would not be an issue. However, you can work with a producer and uh, just license some of their music or go through a music licensing website like Musicbed or um, Audio Jungle. YouTube actually has some royalty free music that you can use. I would not ever touch a um, piece of music that has uh, not been given permission to you to use. Um, there are, you know, there are some like fair use laws out there, but they're kind of murky and they haven't had super definitive answers. I mean, this even goes to like the rap industry. There've been lawsuits for the last like 10 years around Kanye and, and how he, uh, samples music from other artists. And like, is that legal? What length of time does it need to be? So my, my rule of thumb is always get permission for anything that you want to use. And if it comes to music for your show, either get explicit licensing permission, use royalty free or pay somebody to have it custom made. And in podcasts like the pros, I talk to my audio producer who made the music for creative elements. And he gets into this even more specifically of how to find good music, how to license it, how much you can expect to pay from licensing it. Uh, that is actually in the course as well. And in, in for your audio producer, is this someone that you also found on Upwork or is this a relationship that you've made just kind of in the course of building your audience? He's a freelancer. His name is Brian Skeel. He's great. Um, I believe his website is brianskeelaudio.com. So you could work with Brian as well if you're watching this. Uh, he did an amazing job for me. And uh, he's a freelancer. I don't think he's on Upwork, but I'm sure you could find a great producer on Upwork too. But um, this was something that I took really seriously from the beginning. I knew that I wanted my music to be on my show and nowhere else because that is part of the experience. When you hear that music, you know you're getting into the world of creative elements and that's where we're going to hang out and that's what you can expect. And the music is a big part of that. Uh, as a follow-up question to that, because I think, you know, if, uh, if you're joining us live or if you're someone who's going to watch us on the replay, our audience is often folks who are earlier in the stage, right? Perhaps they're creative themselves. And I think there's sometimes a fear of not like starting with one audio piece for fear that's not perfect. You know, did, did your kind of intro, your outro and those audio clips, did those evolve over time? Like, did you contract out having one made and you're like, ah, as you improve, kind of switch that out? Or have you settled on one and you've been with it the whole time? For both of my shows, I've actually had the same music from the beginning. Um, which I think is important because I, I just took that really seriously. There's, there's not a whole lot in podcasting for you to make a quick first impression. One thing being the artwork you can see here. I also put a lot of effort into this artwork. I found a freelance illustrator. We worked back and forth on this for a while until I got to something I really liked. Um, but the music too, I wanted that to have a very specific feel. So when I worked with Brian as a producer and a lot of producers would do this, I basically gave him like, the mood or emotion that I wanted people to feel when they listen to this. I gave him some examples of songs that I like that make me feel that same emotion. So we used that and he gave me basically three different concepts to choose from Then I chose one and we worked on that one specifically. And that was all done under a, a an exclusive license, which is more expensive than a non-exclusive license. So it, it kind of comes down to how much you want to invest in it from day one and take seriously. If you're working on a budget, I would invest first in uh, audio engineering help because that will make the whole process more sustainable and easy for you to do ongoing and maybe go to like the YouTube audio library to find some um, uh, royalty free music to use as, as your sound. But if you're going to take this seriously and really make a remarkable show the way that I've tried to and the way that I'm encouraging you to, to do, it's worth investing in things up front to make that true because it's gonna pay for itself over the long haul. You wanna go out of the gates with a really strong product because that's gonna help you uh, really grow a lot faster. Thank you for that, Jay. 
Uh, I wanted to ask a, a specific question about your course, uh, Podcasts Like the Pros. So today in the course of like breaking down how you structure in uh, a, one of your podcasts, like a 60 minute one, that seemed very centric, obviously, for the interviewer, interview, interviewee format. In the course, do you cover a bit more kind of different formats? Because like I, I'm going to bring up the question in a second, but just like there's there's obviously tons of different narrative angles you could take with a podcast. Is that something you cover more in depth or is that something you could speak even a bit on today? Yeah, totally. Uh, both is true. I definitely uh, take the posture of assuming a guest interview uh, within the course, but within all the lessons I call out, if you're doing a solo show, here's a way to think about it. Um, the show is really, or the, the course is really about helping you make a high production, high quality, professional sounding show with a small team or a small budget, because I'm just one guy. I don't have unlimited resources. The course is everything I've learned to do things on the cheap while also maintaining super high quality. And that's the, that's the core of the course. You can take all of that and apply it to a solo show or to a, a interview show. Uh, but I can talk about that a little bit more. I think it's even more important actually to choose the angle and maybe even a little bit easier to choose the angle uh, when you're doing an, a solo show um, because you're in total control. Like in an interview, I have assumptions around what would be good to talk to a guest about, but there's a lot that is emergent from the conversation. And so the angle helps me to kind of keep bounds on the things that emerge to make sure we're still moving in one direction that is cohesive. Now with a solo show, every episode is going to be kind of you or uh, whatever you decided to cover. And so it's really important that your episodes are distinct and uh, coherent, frankly. And so to do that, I think you should have a kind of a structure in your mind of, I want people to leave this episode feeling like this, or I want people to leave this episode being able to do this or perform this or uh, solve this problem. You know, every episode should be specific in that way. Think of it even like um, an email with a subject line or an article with a headline. Like it should be something that is grabbing and tie through to that whole episode. Got it. And, and that definitely makes sense. I, I wanted to call out a few things here with uh, we we're starting to come up to time. If there's any last questions folks have for Jay today, you know, use this opportunity to put those in the chat. Additionally, we uh, I posted a few minutes ago the link to Jay's podcast like a pros course, and uh, you know if you feel free to click that. Also, it's in the YouTube description. And if you're watching this on the replay, or uh, perhaps you're watching this in some other spot, don't worry, we'll also send that link out via email. Uh, w one thing we didn't necessarily get into today, but I've heard you speak on a bit in the past, is I mean you've you touched on it, but we didn't go deep into it. Is Obviously, the storytelling is a, a big piece of what you do on the podcast itself. But when it comes to bringing your guests on and talking in those templates, like when you were earlier in this process, when you were kind of first starting out, how did you start to put that guest list together? Because I think it's a bit daunting, especially in the early days, uh, you know, to, to reach out to someone who you perhaps think is out of your league. For sure. And I'm glad you asked this question. This is this is kind of a controversial stance that I take in the course and in life in general. There's kind of this trope in podcasting that you should start with whoever you can reach and then build your way up to bigger guests. They say like start with C level people down to, and then up to B level people and then a level people. I think the opposite is true and should be your goal, which is it's easiest to get a level people when they notice you've talked to other a level people. And so there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg question, right? But I would challenge you to really think about, your network, the people you know, the people you've met, and find a way to get to somebody super high value. And maybe you're like, you know what, Jay, I don't have that. I, I can't do those things. Well, the person that you really want to get on the show, someone who is high value, why do you want to have them on the show? What touch points do you have with that person? Um, when I had Seth on the show, part of the reason I was able to get Seth is I've gone through a lot of his programs. And I've actually interacted with him over email from some of his programs. And I thought to myself, if I respond to an email that he um, already responded to once with me, he already saw that like we exchanged something, maybe he'll take me seriously because he knows that I've been doing this podcasting thing for a couple of years and that worked. So think about like who, who have you maybe purchased a program from or 
or um, had an exchange with over social media that it's a high value person and try to get that person. And it may be worth delaying the launch of your show for weeks or months for you to get that interview and start that way. Because otherwise, once your show exists and it has a guest list and it has history, people are gonna look at that to see, should I take this seriously? And I think coming out of the gates with a really strong guest list or um, a really high production quality with the solo show will help people take it seriously from day one. That is so interesting. Um, I, that's actually like a really, I think a very powerful and also just, I haven't really heard that viewpoint. Um, every blog you see, every like random medium article is, you know, work your way up, use this as a body of work. But if, if I hear you correctly, you're saying, hold, like it's okay to not launch. It's okay to take, if it takes you an extra two months, go after who you want to go for, because that's going to set the tone for everyone you get here on out. Look, people who are busy and difficult to get a hold of, if you pitch them on your show, they're not going to take the time to listen to an hour long episode to see like, is this a good show? They're going to make snap decisions. And the best way to do that is to look at your show listing, your show directory, see how many reviews does this show have on Apple podcasts? Cause I'm going to then approximate that to audience size and who have they had on the show before? They're just looking for someone else to help make the decision for them. And easier ways to make decisions are if they can justify the reach of the show, or if they see people they know and respect have already made the decision in the affirmative, they're more likely to do the same. That that applies not even just for podcasting. I mean, I, as you say this, I'm like, these are lessons for us too. <laughs> and the things we do at Discover. Social so, proof is just a very real thing. Yeah, like it, people, it really people is. use that as a heuristic all the time. Well, uh, with that, um, actually, hang on a second. I wanted to grab this question. The... I had one last question I wanted to bring up for the audience today because you covered the, the this piece, the social proof. Uh, man, I just lost it because I had one more question as a follow-up to it. I'm going to have to wait for the next time to talk to you on it. Um, for everyone who is with us, because I know it's a good Friday. I know it's a, it's a Friday afternoon. And Jay, I can't thank you enough for being with us. For those who are with us, let us know in the chat that you appreciate Jay being here. Um, even if you watch us on a replay, because I know folks come watch these on our replays, type it later. We don't care. Um, so <laughs> I want Jay to understand that, that – uh, you know, we, we appreciate him being here because he's some, these are free workshops and it matters to us. Uh, is there any last words of wisdom you wanted to give to this? And I, I remember the question. The question was your NPS pieces, because I think that that's an important part is like, how do you, as you, you book a guest that's aspirational, how do you then use that kind of feedback to decide who you're going to book next? Like, do you look at those pieces to see if that content resonates? Oh, interesting. Um, well, I don't have NPS on podcast episodes, typically that that is on people who have taken the course and who have enjoyed the course but i do anecdotally listen to my audience all the time we have yeah. a listener community on facebook and um i will periodically solicit guest recommendations from my audience both on twitter and on my facebook group to say who do you want to hear from and uh if somebody suggests somebody that seems like they'd be a good fit for the show as far as like the theme and the format of the show i try to get that person on that happened with maddie benedetto maddie benedetto the guy who does unnecessary inventions on Instagram. Mm -hmm. That was a listener uh, request. The template I showed you of Alan Gannett, that was a tweet between me and Alan, a listener of the show tweeted at both of us and said, do you guys know each other? It seems like you guys would really get along and I'd love to hear a conversation with the two of you. And so I met Alan just over Twitter because of that tweet and we recorded an episode this week. So I, I listen to my audience because ultimately like they're the people I serve. They're the people I want to uh, continue to build a relationship with, and I need to get outside of my own bubble too. It's easier to listen to guest recommendations to meet people that I don't even know exist because I don't know who I don't know. That makes sense. So in the beginning, as, is it fair to say, as you like really started out and you, uh, Seth Godin was obviously one of your aspirational early bookings as your audience develops, that's really helped you kind of shape out how your, your future bookings and folks you bring on the podcast has, has, has shaped out for sure. Anything that you create, any, any content or product you create and people are going to interact with, you got to listen to those people and continue to build for them um, and listen to them and honor that relationship you have with them. And the best way to do that is to say, I hear you and I agree with what you're saying and here's the decision I'm going to make, or here's the path forward I'm going to make because of it. Well, Jay, thank you again. I know we're running up to time. Uh, any last words of wisdom? Um, and I'll repost that link. I see Sunita just commented on that. But yeah, any last words of wisdom you'd love to leave this audience with today? 
like I said earlier, there are a lot of reasons to start a podcast. Even if you aren't willing to put in all of the production work that I've kind of laid out here or in the course, you can have a really impactful show to your own life. Even if you don't have a giant audience, you never know what individual is listening that can immediately change the course of your entire life because they found your show. You don't need a giant audience. You don't have to monetize with a ton of ads to have a really meaningful, impactful uh, podcast experience. Thank you so much, Jay. With that, folks, we're going to be signing off in just a second. We appreciate you joining us. Jay, we appreciate you being on the show. Thank you again. Uh, and everyone have a, a wonderful holiday weekend. Thank you, everybody.